subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IA Study Circle. Now here is an announcement for you. We have released the Mains Compass 2020 for economic development and you can find this in the section of study materials. So when you go to the section of study material, just go on to the section of compilations and here select mains and you filter it out. The moment you filter it out, you will find the mains compass 2020 for economic development. Now, As you can see, the mains compass for economic development has been categorized as per sections. So the sections include agriculture and allied sector, public distribution system, functioning limitations and way forward, land reforms in India, inclusive growth and development, banking and finance, budgeting and taxation, industrial policy and LPG, employment skills and labor reforms, external sector, infrastructure and investment sector, as well as food processing and industries. So go through the mains compass 2020 of Ra's IES study circle on the topic of economic development as it has provided section wise detailed analysis of important topics which can be asked in your upcoming mains examination 2021 which is to be held in January. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC perspective. Now today we shall analyze the Hindu newspaper dated 30th October 2020. The news to be discussed has been displayed on your screen and time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from our prelims as well as mains point of view. The first news to be discussed appears on page number 1 as well as on page number 2. The news says that center sets up commission to tackle NCR pollution. 22 year old EPCA dissolved, new body brought in through an ordinance and it awaits formal perusal by the Supreme Court of India. And it is in this connection news on page number 2 says that the Supreme Court will study the ordinance to check stubble burning. So, through an ordinance, the central government has established the Commission for Air Quality Management in National Capital Region and adjoining areas and it shall have a full-time chairperson who is or has been either secretary to the government of India or chief secretary of any state. Further, this commission shall be an 18-member commission. Now, here the term adjoining areas refers to the regions or states of Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan as well as Uttar Pradesh adjoining the national capital territory of Delhi and the national capital region and these areas especially with respect to source of pollution which is causing adverse impact on air quality in the national capital region. So the commission established by the central government that is the commission for air quality management in national capital region and adjoining areas will supersede all bodies or authorities formed through judicial orders and this commission will be the sole authority for air quality management in the national capital territory of Delhi and the adjoining areas. Now this means that EPCA has been dissolved as well as recently the Supreme Court of India constituted a one member committee led by former justice Madan B. Lokur. So this committee has also been now dissolved. So now it is the Commission for Air Quality Management in National Capital Region and Adjoining Areas that will look into the aspects of air pollution. So it is in this regard the Government of India has introduced the Commission for Air Quality Management in National Capital Region and Adjoining Areas Ordinance 2020. And the main aim of this ordinance is to set up a commission which provides for regulation of air pollution. So the ordinance highlights that it aims to provide for constitution of commission for air quality management in national capital region and adjoining areas for better coordination, research, identification and resolution of problems surrounding the air quality index and also for related matters. So this is with respect to the purpose for which this particular ordinance has been passed by the central government. Now as per this ordinance, it establishes three subcommittees and these three subcommittees are with respect to number one monitoring and identification, number two a subcommittee for safeguarding and enforcement and number three a subcommittee for research and development. So we understand that this commission has been empowered with respect to monitoring and identification of problems related to air pollution surrounding the NCR region, 
providing safeguards as well as enforcing these safeguards to curb air pollution in the region and also to provide for research and development so that new innovative techniques can be found with respect to curbing air pollution especially during winters in national capital territory of delhi as well as the surrounding or adjoining areas so in this regard let us go through some of the important powers and functions of the commission for air quality management in national capital region and adjoining areas so with respect to the powers of the commission it highlights that the commission will be empowered to issue directions to control air pollution and also take cognizance of complaints so number 1 the commission can issue directions in order to control air pollution in ncr and adjoining areas number 2 the commission can also regulate or prohibit activities that are likely to cause or increase air pollution in ncr and adjoining areas so the second power is that the commission can regulate or prohibit activities which enhances or increases air pollution in the region third the commission can lay down parameters of air quality so this is a very important powers given to this commission that it can lay down parameters of air quality fourth the commission can lay down restrictions or safeguards for industrial operations affecting air quality so the commission can also lay down these parameters or restrictions as well as safeguards to regulate industrial activity which has an impact on air pollution or which impacts air quality so the commission can regulate industrial activity or operations number 5 the commission shall have power to inspect any premises including any plant equipment machinery manufacturing or any other process which impacts air quality so the fifth power with respect to the commission is for inspection of any premises which impacts air quality number 6 the commission can appoint officers with the prior approval of the central government and also empower these officers to tackle air pollution and also take requisite steps so this is the sixth power with respect to this commission who can appoint officers with prior approval of the central government who are empowered to take requisite steps to tackle air pollution further the ordinance highlights that any offense that is non compliance of the directions of the commissions shall be considered as a non cognizable offense and such non cognizable offense shall be tried by a judicial magistrate of first class now as per the criminal procedure code non cognizable offense means an offense for which non cognizable case that is a case in which police officer has no authority to arrest without warrant so a non cognizable offense means an offense in which police cannot arrest any person without a warrant further the ordinance also provides for certain penalties it says any contravention or non compliance of directions issued by the commission shall be an offense which can be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend up to 5 years or with a fine which may extend up to rupees 1 crore or both so any contravention or non compliance of the directions of commission can attract both imprisonment as well as fine and the imprisonment can extend up to 5 years and the fine can extend up to rupees 1 crore so these can be said to be some of the important powers of the commission established by the central government to tackle air pollution in ncr and adjoining areas now after understanding the powers of the commission let us also understand how the commission will implement these powers so in this regard let us discuss about some of the functions which can be performed by the commission to tackle air pollution first the commission can take up matter so moto that is by their own if they find that air pollution is increasing because of a particular purpose or because of particular activity so the commission can either take up matter so moto or if any complaint is registered or made by any individual any representative body or organization who are working in the field of environment and if such complaint is made against any individual association company public undertaking or even local body carrying on any industrial activity operation or process which impacts air quality in the surrounding region further the commission is also empowered under the ordinance to provide mechanism 
as well as the means to implement in the national capital region and adjoining areas the following number 1 the national clean air program of the central government national air quality monitoring program as well as national ambient air quality standards now with respect to national clean air program it is a long term time bound program to reduce particulate matter by 20 to 30% by 2024 and for this purpose this program has kept 2017 as the base year for comparison of concentration of particulate matter in the air further the government is executing a nationwide national air quality monitoring program with respect to ambient air quality monitoring known as NAMP now under this quality monitoring program four air pollutants namely sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide suspended particulate matters that is pm10 and fine particulate matter that is pm2.5 has been identified for regular monitoring at all the locations now in addition there are 134 real time continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations and these monitor eight pollutants namely pm10 pm2.5 sulfur dioxide nitrous oxides ammonia carbon monoxide ozone as well as benzene now regarding the national ambient air quality standards these are standards for ambient air quality with reference to various identified pollutant notified by central pollution control board under the air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 and the major objective of national ambient air quality standards are to indicate necessary air quality levels and appropriate margins required to ensure the protection of vegetation health and property to provide a uniform yardstick for the assessment of air quality at the national level and to indicate the extent and need of the monitoring program now we have already discussed in detail about national ambient air quality standards in the dns dated 17th october 2020 here we also studied a comparative analysis of suffer that is system of air quality and weather forecasting and research naaqs as well as air quality index here we also studied that national ambient air quality standards is notified by the central pollution control board and under the standard it comprises of 12 pollutants these 12 pollutants are sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide pm10 pm2.5 ozone lead carbon monoxide ammonia benzene benzopyrene arsenic as well as nickel so please go through the dns dated 17th october 2020 to further understand these different aspects which can be asked in your prelims as well as mains examination now moving further with respect to other functions of the commission it also aims to provide an effective framework and platform in the national capital region and adjoining areas for source identification of air pollutants on periodic basis taking on ground steps for curbing air pollution specific research and development in the field of air pollution synergizing the energies and efforts of all stakeholders in developing innovative ways to monitor enforce and research on issues concerning air pollution building a network between technical institutions working or researching in the field of air pollution it also provides for international cooperation including sharing of best practices in the field of air pollution and also training and creating a special workforce to tackle the problem of air pollution so these are the effective steps which the commission can take especially regarding the research and finding innovative ways to tackle air pollution which includes finding the source of air pollutants taking steps at the ground to curb air pollution furthering specific research and development in the field of air pollution synergizing the energies and efforts of all stakeholders including government educational institution private institutions ngos etc in order to develop innovative ways to monitor enforce and also research on issues concerning air pollution building a network between technical institutions who is working in the field of research and development in the field of air pollution and also looking forward to international cooperation and sharing best practices in the field of tackling air pollution and also providing training thereby creating a special workforce to tackle the problem of air pollution another functions of the commission includes providing an effective framework action plan and also to take appropriate steps to tackle the problem of stubble burning monitoring assessing and inspecting air pollution agents and also increasing plantations in the surrounding areas further to monitor measures taken by states to prevent stubble burning promote awareness about the perils of air pollution on health 
among various sections of the society and also to encourage the efforts of NGOs and institutions who are working in the field of air pollution. So these are the important functions which are to be performed by the commission which has been constituted through an ordinance of the central government. This both these news appearing on page number one as well as page number two becomes very important from the perspective of our prelims as well as mains examination. Now in the prelims, this topic gets covered under general issues on environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change and in the mains, it gets covered under GS paper 3 under environmental pollution and degradation and in GS paper 2, especially with respect to statutory, regulatory and various quasi-judicial bodies. So with this discussion, let's move on to our next news analysis. Now the next news to be discussed appears on page number 7 and is also with respect to air pollution and its causes especially during winter in the national capital region of Delhi and its surrounding areas. So this news says less pollution more soil fertility. Now in this analysis let us understand as to why air pollution in Delhi increases especially during the onset of winter in the months of October as well as November. So with respect to causing of air pollution in Delhi especially during the onset of winter here are three important factors. Let us understand these three important factors, especially with respect to the geographical factor. Then we shall try and understand how this geographical factor coincides with the burning of paddy stock in Haryana as well as Punjab. Now the first reason highlights that the month of October sees withdrawal of monsoon. And this withdrawal of monsoon leads to change in direction of wind. So after withdrawal of monsoon that is with respect to change in direction of wind 72% of wind in Delhi start coming from the northwest. That is if this is the area of Delhi then 72% of wind in Delhi start coming from the areas of northwest including the areas of Punjab as well as Haryana. Whereas the only remaining 28% of the wind which comes to Delhi come from the Indo-Gangetic Plains. So the first reason is that the month of October sees withdrawal of monsoon and this leads to change in direction of the wind. And here what happens is that 72% of the wind coming to Delhi comes from the northwest region. Now this becomes one of the most important factor with respect to coming of pollution in Delhi especially because of stubble burning in the state of Punjab as well as Haryana. Now the second reason is with respect to reduction in temperature with the onset of winter. Now what happens is that decrease in temperature traps pollutants in the lower layer of the atmosphere along with the pollutants. And since the decrease in temperature does not allow the air to rise thereby it not only traps pollutants but also leads to concentration of polluted air close to the surface especially in Delhi. Now this aspect of geography that is this aspect of reduction in temperature is further aided by various pollutions which is generated in Delhi from different sources. All these pollutions generated within the city of Delhi also gets trapped close to the surface in winter because of reduction in temperature. Now this also decreases air quality because of trapping of pollutants closer to the surface in Delhi and adjoining areas. Now the third reason is decrease in wind speed. Now when wind blows with sufficient speed it also carries away the pollutants along with it. However with decrease in speed of wind it does not allow the pollutant air to get dispersed and the polluted air gets concentrated very quickly as compared to the summer seasons. So all these factors lead to concentration of pollution in Delhi and also in the surrounding regions. Now what's add to this problem of pollution in Delhi is stubble burning in the states of Punjab as well as Haryana before sowing of Rabi crop in October November period. So stubble burning in the states of Punjab and Haryana further deteriorates air quality of NCR and adjoining areas because the month of October sees withdrawal of monsoon and the fact that 72% of the wind in Delhi starts coming from the northwest region. So stubble burning further deteriorates air quality in Delhi and adjoining areas. 
So apart from the geographical factor, let us understand that how does farm fires or stubble burning plays an additional role in polluting the atmosphere of Delhi. Now generally we have seen an increase in farm fires post 2009. Now let us understand why. Now with the onset of technology, use of combined harvesters increased and this use of combined harvesters leaves behind crop residue or tall stalks, especially that of paddy. Now these tall stalks which is there in the field have to be removed before new plant or before new crop is sown for the next season. So the best way to remove these tall stalks is to burn them. So farm fires began to be used as a cheap and effective way to remove these tall stalks or paddy stalks. As mostly paddy or rice is grown in these areas. Now this practice of stubble burning or farm fires gained widespread acceptance because of a law passed by the governments of Punjab and Haryana. Now the governments of Punjab and Haryana passed a law whereby the sowing of paddy was compulsorily delayed to coincide the sowing with monsoon. And this was done so that extra groundwater was not extracted for the purpose of sowing of paddy. Now another reason why paddy stocks were burned because they cannot be used as livestock feed because of high concentration of silica. So all these aspects led to the practice of stubble burning. Now we all know that growing paddy needs more water. So by a law passed by the state government of Punjab and Haryana, sowing of paddy was delayed to coincide with monsoon as this required less ground water and also ensured that less ground water was extracted. Now what happened continuously was late sowing of paddy resulted in late harvesting of paddy. Now late harvesting of paddy also resulted in less time for clearing fields. So since less time was left for the farmers to clear fields so that they can sow the next crop that is wheat. So they started burning their crop residue or paddy stalks. So the burning of paddy stalk so that the next cycle of crop that is wheat could be sown coincides with the onset of winter in the months of October. And we have already seen that October sees withdrawal of monsoon and because of this 72% of the wind in Delhi comes from northwest. So what happens is that when these crop residues are burned in the states of Punjab and Haryana then the smoke get carried away along the wind in Delhi and this further deteriorates the air quality in Delhi because 72% of the wind coming to Delhi comes from the northwest region. So it is in this regard there have been various steps which have been taken by the government to counter Delhi's air pollution. The first is with respect to notification of graded response action plan for Delhi identifying source-wise actions for various levels of air pollution. Now as per the decision of Supreme Court of India in 2016 with respect to MC Mehta versus Union of India regarding air quality in national capital region of Delhi, a graded response action plan was prepared and this was prepared for implementation under different air quality index categories namely moderate and poor, very poor, severe as per the national air quality index. However, a new category was also added namely severe plus or emergency. So based on these different air quality index categories, the government can take different measures to control air pollution in the national capital region of Delhi. So when the air pollution is in the category of severe or in the category of emergency, then entry of truck traffic into Delhi is stopped apart from those trucks carrying essential commodities. Construction activities is prohibited or halted and the Delhi government introduces odd and even scheme for private vehicle owners. Further, the task force constituted is also empowered to take any decisions regarding additional steps including shutting off schools. Further, when the air pollution is in the category of severe, then the government can close brick kilns, hot mix plants and stone crushers. Further, the government orders shutting down of Badarpur power plant and also to maximize generation of power from existing natural gas based plants. And this is also done keeping in view the reduction in operation of coal based power plants. 
Further, the government also intensifies public transport services and also introduces differential rates to encourage off-peak travel. Now, when the air pollution is in the category of severe, then there is also an increase in frequency of mechanized cleaning of road and also sprinkling of water on roads. And also roads are identified having stretches of high dust generation. Thus, these were some of the actions taken under the Graded Response Action Plan. Further, the government has shifted from BS4 to BS6 standard norms for vehicles by 1st April 2020, especially in the Delhi NCR region. Further, the government has notified national ambient air quality standards and also sector-specific emission and effluent standards for industries. Further, the government has also set up monitoring network for assessment of ambient air quality. Further, the government has also introduced cleaner gaseous fuels like CNG, LPG, etc. and ethanol blending. Further, the government has also launched National Air Quality Index to keep a track of pollution in the air. Further, the government also bans burning of biomass. Government also promotes use of public transport network. And also various directions are issued by the government under Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981. Further, the government has also installed online continuous 24-7 monitoring devices by 17 highly polluting industrial sectors. Further, the government also regulates bursting of pollution emitting crackers. Government has also installed smog towers to tackle pollution problem. And lastly, the government has also constituted the Commission for Air Quality Management in National Capital Region and adjoining areas, which we have seen in our first news analysis. So these are some of the steps taken by the government to counter Delhi's air pollution problems, especially during winter. Thus, this article becomes important both from the perspective of prelims as well as mains examination. In the prelims, it gets covered under general issues related to environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change and in the mains, gets covered under GS paper 3, especially with respect to environment. So with this, let's move on to our next news discussion. The next news to be discussed appears as an editorial on page number 6. The news says, gaps in learning. Students can still learn during the pandemic if they get textbooks and resources. Now, this editorial highlights about the latest annual status of education report, that is ASE report of 2020. Now, this is the 15th survey conducted by the NGO Pratham. Now, the overall highlight of this survey is with respect to digital inequality, especially among school children of rural areas and also school children of poor households. Another important aspect which has come out with respect to this report is the use of smartphone in children's education. And it is here where such students have suffered whose parents do not have a smartphone, mostly from poor households. So this report highlights that COVID pandemic has further increased inequality, especially digital inequality among school children. And 24.3% of the students who were surveyed did not receive any study materials from their schools because their parents did not have any smartphone. Now another important aspect highlighted here is that 11% of parents purchase smartphone only for children's education so that the children's education, especially during the lockdown, is not discontinued. So we are witnessing a trend with respect to shifting towards smartphone or use of smartphone for students' education or for students' learning. Now another important aspect highlighted with respect to this report is that results of such children were better whose parents were educated till class 10s or whose parents were further educated and results of children were comparatively poor whose parents were not that much educated. So these can be said to be some of the overall highlight with respect to the annual status of education report of 2020. Now the whole purpose of this report conducted by the NGO Pratham is to find out children's enrollment in schools and also to assess their basic learning level. Now this survey is conducted at the level of household and not at the level of school. So it also includes such children who are either dropouts or who have not attended school altogether. So in this regard, let us go through some of the important key findings with respect to the ASER report and also some of the challenges in order to address digital inequality, especially among school children from rural areas and also from poor households. Now apart from the factor of digital divide or digital inequality, Enrollment of children with respect to government schools have increased as compared to 2018 from 44.3% in 2018 to 49.6% in 2020. So in this regard, the report says 
that government school enrollment rose from 44.3% in 2018 to 49.6% in 2020, despite the fact that schools were closed, especially during the COVID lockdown. Now, as per this table, as you can see, that for 2018, the report of ASER highlighted that for standard 1 to 2, enrollment in government school was 57.9%, whereas in 2020, the enrollment has increased from 57.9% to 61.1%. Similarly, for class 3 to 5, the enrollment in government school was 62.7%, whereas in 2020, this enrollment increased to 65.6% in 2020. Now for class 6 to 8, the enrollment for government schools was 65.8%, whereas this also increased to 68.3% for the year 2020. Again in 2018, standard 9 and above, the school enrollment was 64.6% for government schools, whereas for 2020, this increased to 69.7%. And overall, children's enrollment for government schools was 62.8% for 2018, which increased to 66.4% for government schools as per the report of 2020. So clearly we can see an increase in enrollment across sections, that is across classes. However, at the same time, enrollment of students for private schools have decreased as it was 37.2% as per the ASE report of 2018, which has decreased to 33.6% as per the ASE report of 2020. So children's enrollment for private schools have decreased as compared to 2018. Now considering the aspect of digital divide, this report says that only approximately 45% government school students have smartphone and 61% of learning material is being delivered through WhatsApp. So considering both these aspects of school enrollment as well as digital divide, let us go through some of the challenges with respect to children's education during the pandemic or during the lockdown. Now during the lockdown, it was observed that there was more use of smartphone for education purpose, especially among private schools. So this aspect of digital divide becomes one of the greatest challenges to overcome. Now another challenge which needs to be overcome is with respect to low literacy level of parents as this impacts a child's performance as not much help is provided at home to such children by their parents and mostly such condition is found in poor households. So the government must provide special attention or extra focus to such children of poor households and also such children whose parents literacy level is comparatively lower. Now another challenges faced during this lockdown was of migration, poor home based support setup as well as self learning challenges. Now regarding migration an example highlighted here is that one of the student was enrolled in Mumbai had to shift to Latur during the pandemic lockdown with their parents and because of this situation he could not either access test book from his school and because of this situation he could not access test book provided by the schools and also could not study in the village as the academic year had already started. Now many families migrated to their hometown during the lockdown and children of such parents were the worst sufferer with respect to access to education. Now another problem faced by the children was poor home based support setup because of the lockdown. So in the week of the survey, Asir found out that because of lack of home based support setup needed for education about one in three rural children had done no learning activity at all. Further, the report highlighted that about two in three students had no learning materials or activity given by the school that particular week and only one in 10 students had access to live online classes, especially in the rural areas. So the situation with respect to education deteriorated during the lockdown period. Now another important aspect highlighted here is with respect to self-learning challenges as it highlights that about 20% of the rural children have no textbook at home. So these can be said to be some of the challenges with respect to imparting education not only in the rural households but also with respect to the poor households among the rural households. So in this regard there is a need to go for out of box thinking to provide for certain solutions so that such children are not denied access to education. And it is here where out of box thinking is necessary in order to use creative learning opportunities to broaden the learning perspective. So here one of the suggestions is that 
in lower classes observational learning should be promoted as it builds strong foundation for such children another important aspect highlighted here is that expansion of availability of textbooks especially in rural areas so here what can be done is a sort of a library can be created in every gram panchayat especially for school children as this will help to increase access of education for such children another important aspect is that home support must be provided especially in future cases of lockdown with respect to any other diseases another important aspect is that educational videos must be promoted using talented teacher or such persons who have good communication skills and have passion to teach students now in an example highlighted here is that tamil nadu and kerala have already hosted curriculum based videos lessons on the internet after beaming them on the television another important aspect highlighted here is that hybrid solution of partially opening schools and online learning can be utilized or can be further promoted and here state government in consultation with the central government can come up with a national or a state level program for education of children which can be telecasted on the television through doordarshan thus there is a need to come up with innovative steps to reduce digital inequality especially among children from rural households as it will not only increase access to education but will also improve educational learning for the students now this topic becomes important primarily from the perspective of your mains examination under gs paper 2 especially with respect to issues relating to education and in the prelims it gets covered under rights issues and also under social sector initiatives so with this analysis let us move to the next topic of discussion now the next news to be discussed appears as a lead article appearing on page number 6 it says india us defense partnership is deepening the optics around the 2 plus 2 dialogue in delhi are defining the defense ties between the two countries have come of age now overall this article effectively talks about the distance both india and united states have traveled from the year 1991 to the present 2 plus 2 dialogue which took place in 2020 so over the period of years this article highlights the growing relationship between india and united states which also saw certain constraints so effectively the article highlights about the 1991 kicklighter proposals where lieutenant general claud kicklighter of united states suggested to establish contact between the three services to promote exchanges and also explore areas of cooperation so this suggestion of the general resulted in a 1995 agreement with respect to minute on defense cooperation which led to the secretary level talk and also establishment of a technology group now from 1995 we move on to 1998 as india tested its nuclear weapons and sanctions were imposed by united states however the year 2000 witnessed changing relationships between india and united states with respect to visit of united states president bill clinton to india and this resulted in transformation between the two strange democracies to natural allies further in 2005 the sanctions which were imposed on india by united states were gradually lifted now from 2004 to 2014 we saw a very different india united states relationship especially under the prime ministership of manmohan singh so here in 2008 both india and united states signed the indo nuclear deal further in 2013 the good relations between the two countries continued and it led to joint declaration on defense cooperation further in 2015 under the presidentship of obama the us administration announced the us administration announced the joint strategic vision for asia pacific and indian ocean region now in 2016 us made india a major defense partner and lastly in 2018 all these relationships culminated in the first 2 plus 2 dialogue between india and united states so elevation of india us strategic and commercial dialogue led to the 2 plus 2 dialogue and this overall reflected the comprehensive global strategic partnership between the two countries now it is here where the author says that india has come of age and is trying to break shackles of the past and this can be witnessed as india has recently signed the basic exchange and cooperation agreement with united states with respect to sharing of geospatial data now here the author highlights about gsomia that is general security of military information agreement 
relating to security of each other's military information which was signed in 2002. Now after GSO MIA was signed in 2002, the Congress-led United Progressive Alliance government signed the End Use Monitoring Agreement that is EUMA in 2009. However, was reluctant to sign other defense agreements or defense deals on grounds of losing strategic autonomy. Now as per the author, the present government has tried to break the shackles of the past by signing the Logistics Exchange Memorandum Agreement, which is related to exchange of logistics support. Now LEMOA was signed in 2016 and this was followed by signing COMCA signed 2018, which permitted encryption standards of communication system between the two countries. COMCASA stands for Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement. And signing of COMCASA further led to signing of Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement, that is BECA. And it is here where the author says that India-US defense ties has come of age of late. And this can also be seen with respect to operationalization of Quad. Further, India has also been invited for the first time to attend the Five Eyes, that is a signals intelligence groupings set up in 1941, which consists of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States. And it is in this regard the author says that traveling to India by United States Secretary of State and Defense Secretary means a lot, especially with respect to 2 plus 2 dialogue and also with respect to deepening of defense ties between India and United States. So here the author says that the Indian strategic community needs to appreciate that policies cannot become prisoners of labels. And ultimately the policy objective is to enhance India's strategic space and capability. And this is the real symbolism of in-person meeting in Delhi with respect to 2 plus 2 dialogue. So these are the developments which has been highlighted in this particular article which led from 1991 to 2020 especially with respect to 2 plus 2 dialogue. So it is in this regard the author concludes by saying that the difference ties between the two countries has come of age. Thus this article becomes important with respect to current events of international importance from your prelims perspective and in your mains gets covered under GS paper 2 especially with respect to bilateral and global groupings and also effects of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interest. With this, let's move on to the next news of discussion. The next news to be discussed appears on page number 1. The news says, lowest core sector shrinking since March, rise in steel, electricity and coal output. Now this graph highlights the performance of core sectors, especially during the COVID times and as you can see, slowly the core sectors are performing comparatively better as compared to April 2020. Now important aspect with respect to 8 core industries, it is released by the Office of Economic Advisor under Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade. Now 8 core industries comprise 40.27% of the weight of items included in the index of industrial production. Now it highlights that the combined index of 8 core industries stood at 119.7 in September 2020 which declined by 0.8% as compared to the index of September 2019 that is a year earlier. It further says that its cumulative growth during April to September period for 2020-21 has been in negative 14.9%. Now as the news highlights that the sector of coal steel as well as electricity have seen an increment with respect to their production. Whereas the sectors of crude oil, natural gas, refinery products, fertilizers as well as cement have declined. Now important point to be noted here is that refinery products have the maximum weightage among the eight core industries. Now this information has also been provided in the PDF. So please go through the PDF with respect to all these information with respect to these eight core sectors. Now this topic becomes important primarily from the perspective of prelims examination. Now the next news to be discussed appears as an article on page number seven. Now this news highlights about a discussion with respect to waning of superpower status of United States of America. So here the article argues two sides of the story. One, whether US is still the superpower and secondly whether China is slowly competing with United States of America. So it is in this regard, this aspect of superpower vis-a-vis -vis emerging power has been described in this particular discussions or in this particular interview. So in this regard, let us go through some of the important highlights with respect to both sides of the discussion. 
that is whether us is still the superpower and secondly whether the power and status of united states is declining now a superpower is typically characterized by a state's ability to exert influence and project itself as a dominating power anywhere in the world and according to world economic forum the united states is currently the only global military power with the ability to plan destroy sustain and fight on a large scale at a distance from its homeland across land sea air as well as space in such a way that is just not possible for any other country so it is in this regard some sections of the society believes that united states is still a superpower however the status of superpower enjoyed by united states is slowly and surely challenged by china now another aspects of superpower is highlighted where it says that there are several measurements of power which includes military and economic strength as well as diplomatic and cultural influence as a superpower should be a leader in all of these areas so in this regard some people argue that if power were solely measured in military terms then there is no question that united states is the only military superpower and china is still a distant second in terms of military spending as if we compare the military spending of united states and china it is 250 billion us dollars for china whereas for us it is 620 us billion dollars however change in global order and a multipolar world is changing the scenario somewhat and also the aggressive rise of china can be seen as challenging the superpower status of united states so the other side of the discussion deals with weakening superpower status here says that some argue that the world is increasingly becoming multipolar and a rebalancing of power is going on among the nations in the world and there is also persistent rise of powerful actors who are not nations whether they are terrorist organizations or multinational corporations which are increasingly important actors on the world stage however others argue that america still has a huge lead over other countries for example it has still four times as much wealth as china and five to six times the military capabilities however under donald trump administration america's global influence is declining and this is also visible in united states pulling out of key organizations like unesco who paris deal etc now even the united states is pulling out of afghanistan and also brokering a deal with taliban and this also can be seen as a weakening stance of united states of america as it no longer wants to get involved in the middle east further the image of us has also seen a setback on various fronts visible in handling of covid pandemic and also with respect to its economic impact on united states of america also with respect to the foreign policy of us with respect to north korea israel and afghanistan and iran another aspect highlighted is that the trade war between us and china is decreasing the influence of us on global economy as it is being seen as a sign of the world moving away from multilateralism towards protectionism so these are some of the discussions with respect to weakening superpower status of united states so as a way forward we can say that given the economic and military might of united states it is likely to remain superpower however if us continues to disengage itself from the burning global issues this trend of declining influence will continue and the status of united states as a superpower will be challenged in time to come further along with the rise of china economically as well as militarily and its increasing influence through belt and road initiative can further threaten the position of united states as a superpower so this entire discussion is with respect to the fact that whether united states is still a superpower as well as whether it will remain superpower in times to come and this discussion is based on russian president vladimir putin's view that china and germany are soon going to become superpowers as us influence wanes globally it further says that today as the us is on the cusp of a new presidency after a remarkable almost 4 years under president donald trump it is worth examining whether its superpower status endures in the realms of politics economics military and diplomatic power as well as culture so all these arguments are with respect to whether united states is still a superpower or not Now after our discussion this becomes your practice question for the day so the question is india has signed which of the following options are first peca second lemoa third comcasa and third euma so the option is select the correct answer using the code given below options are a 2 3 and 4 only 
B, 1, 3 and 4 only. C, 1, 2 and 3 only. And D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now coming to the answer of yesterday, the question was, consider the following statements related to National Infrastructure Pipeline. First, the funding of National Infrastructure Pipeline shall be done by centre and states in proportion of 50-50. No, this is incorrect. Second, the energy sector accounts for the highest financial allocation under NIP. Yes, this is correct. So the question is, which of the statements given above is are correct? So the correct answer is B, that is 2 only. With this, we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you.